Коллеги, добрый день. Colleagues, good afternoon. We start presenting the third and the last for this year edition of the Belarusian Change Tracker. This is a quarterly report by Belarusian experts. My name is Valery Klemenka. I'm the project coordinator for the Friedrich Eberstufung, and I'm going to moderate this event. The purpose of this uh, tracker is to trace policy, economics, and sociology, and the analytical zest of every edition is the opinion poll. And the third edition we are about to present today covers the events of autumn from September till November inclusive. You can study the Belarus Change Tracker on the website of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, and we are going to send the copy of it to all the registered participants. My pleasure is to present you the speakers and the authors of this tracker, Pavel Slunkin, Belarusian ex-diplomat, visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. This is a political analyst. Uh, also of Tom Schreiben, founder and political analyst of uh, Sense Analytics. Uh, he's writing about internal politics, domestic politics. Uh, Peter Bicano, independent sociologist who's responsible for the zist of our tracker, the opinion poll, and no pressure. Hello, Lera. Gennady Korshinov, a senior analyst at the Center for New Ideas. He writes about the relations between, between the uh, government and civil society. Hello. Katerina Bornokova, academic director at Birok, visiting professor at Carlos uh, III University, Madrid. She is writing about the economic aspect. And last but not least, uh, Lev Lvovsky, senior research fellow at Birok. He writes about the domestic economic situation in Belarus. Hello, hello. The format of our meeting is as follows. We are going to start with the presentation of the chapters. Each of the authors will have five minutes timeline, and uh, Philip Ikanov will have a bit more time. After that, we will proceed with the Q&A. And I would like to remind our guests right away that uh, you can ask your questions uh, in the chat of Zoom, and I will do my best to read them out loud. I'm passing the floor to uh, Christopher Frost, uh, Director of Regional Office Dialogue Eastern Europe, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, representative of uh, Belarus. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Valeria, dear guests. Uh, welcome to the launch of the third edition of the Belarus Change Tracker. The Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Germany's oldest political foundation, striving to support the fundamental values of social democracy. We are happy to support another edition of this holistic and very profound research project. The combination of political and economic expertise, as well as a sociological survey, make this project special, especially in the Belarusian context, I must say, where sociological data is rare and hard to get. Um, the developments we are observing are not encouraging, though, and after you have heard the inputs from our experts, the question we will all once again have to ask ourselves is, how could we get here and what can be done about it? Um, Philip, in his part, will actually admit a degree of surprise with regards to some of his findings, as I understand, and even admits that the previous prediction was not correct. Uh, but looking at the previous editions together with this one, especially now at the end of the year, and even more so in the future after more Belarus Change Tracker editions will be published, may still help us to understand some of the developments over time and to come a bit closer to the answer of the question, how could we get here and what can be done about it? Um, this project is called Belarus Change Tracker for a reason, since it actually aims at tracking changes over time. This would be the ultimate aim, and to this both the political and the economic analyses and the sociological data uh, can contribute. The experts are still focusing on recent events, uh, but by covering three months with every edition and by doing this on a regular basis in a set format, they are in a way slowing down things a bit, uh, go a bit deeper into the issues that we can usually in these hectic days. The first two editions have been widely quoted and recognized. We hope this one will be two. More editions will hopefully follow next year. I would not dare to make any concrete predictions what they might focus on next year, though. That's extremely hard to predict right now. Uh, but in any case, I reached an interesting launch. I want to thank our experts once again, uh, as well as my colleagues, especially Valeria, who is moderating today, who have uh, been working on this project and put a lot of work in it. The publication, as Valeria said, is already available in our AVS digital library, where you can also find some other studies which AVS 
has recently supported. Uh, let me close by saying Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine is, of course, a topic that is mentioned on many occasions in this publication. Um, so is the potential loss of sovereignty and the growing influence of Russia across many different sectors. But this should not be the only cluster of topics dominating our discourse. The socioeconomic situation, for example, bothers people a lot. And the war is not the only factor causing this, albeit, of course, the war affects the Belarusian economy to a large extent. Um, vice versa, positive economic developments may have the power to overshadow security related news and so on and so forth. Um, so I would say the best we can do is to continue to look at Belarus as Belarus, not just as Russia's sidekick. This is clearly also what Belarusians expect, and this holds actually true across the political spectrum, and is another good reason for the kind of holistic analysis that our experts are presenting here, which covers a large variety of topics and gives a lot of food for thought with regards to current and future independent Belarus. Thank you, and now over to our experts. Thank you very much, Christopher. As a project manager of this project, I would also like to thank the team, the editors, the designers, and also the technical team that is today in Kyiv, Ukraine. And despite uh, regular blackouts and uh, shelling, have been working very efficiently on this project. Thank you all. Right now we start presentation of the third edition of the Belarusian Change Tracker, which covers the events of this autumn, and I'm passing the floor to the first presenter, Pavel Slunkin, Foreign Policy. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Lera, the first key trend that we have been seeing along all our reports is a gradual deepening of dependence of the Belarusian state on Russia. I call this process a slow desovereignization of Belarus in this report period. I would pay attention especially to the defense uh, sector. Previously, Russian troops that entered Belarus, their presence had been justified by trainings uh, uh, because they came uh, came to Belarus, uh, they had come to Belarus prior to the war, and uh, it was uh, like a military exercise, and uh, it had been justified, uh, and uh, they justified it this way, and uh, their stationing was uh, along that. But the second uh, installment uh, of the servicemen who came to Belarus during the report period was explained that by the deploying of the Russian and Belarusian military grouping. For that, well, maybe not for that, but it is a continuation of this trend. Belarus and Russia, during Defense Minister Shaigu, Defense Minister of Russia, he came to Belarus and uh, they signed an agreement on uh, joint uh, insurance of uh, regional security. So they amended it. So previously, the wording was uh, deployment of uh, the military units. So this might happen. And right now it is going on. So the suggestion that was made by Russia to amend it says uh, dislocation or stationing of the military infrastructure uh, elements that would ensure operations of the regional grouping. So we can conclude the troops are expected to be in Belarus for for a long time. And uh, again, this is a guessing or the outcome of the analysis because the ultimate version of the document that was amended and concluded between the countries has never been published. And also during the, during the report period, Belarus has been getting deeper into the involvement in the war. There were a few investigations uh, uh, that disclosed uh, that Belarusian government was providing medical assistance to the Russian servicemen. Belarusian diplomats voted at the United Nations against the resolution initiated by Ukraine and its allies. Uh, it, it is the resolution about uh, the reparations to be made by Russia to restore economic uh, the economy of ukraine and uh, its infrastructure so 
Belarus voted against it for two times, and Belarus continues sharing its military equipment with Russia. The migration crisis continues. We start forgetting about it, but still, this is a topical uh, factor. On the western borders of Belarus, we, we do not see the figures that we could see in November 2021, but still, the figures are high. Dozens of illicit migrants uh, were on the border with Lithuania, then the Belarusian Special Services refocused them on the Polish border. For a few days, there were 100 or over 100 people who attempted uh, to cross the border through the help of Belarusian Special Services. They were attempted to get to Ukraine. So the integrity of uh, engagement into the war, defensorization of Belarus, migration crisis at the border provoke neighbors on the western borders uh, and in principle all neighbors but for russia to uh, strengthen their security they build physical barriers on the border and therefore uh, they uh, are building or we can see the iron curtain erected Lithuania and poland uh, erected uh, pop wire fences uh, uh, also the uh, uh, the concrete walls may, were made by Poland and uh, Ukraine is making fortifications, um, they are planting mines, uh, they explode uh, and destroy bridges. So that's how the border with Belarus looks like. This is like a iron curtain, a real physical iron curtain. And uh, the revision of the relations with Belarus uh, also concerned the regulatory framework. Latvia, Lithuania suspended uh, a number of bilateral agreements, including technical ones and more important ones. For example, Latvia suspended the agreement on simplification of cross border travel for citizens. Ukraine is a leader. Ukraine has been suspending the, the action of uh, dozens of bilateral agreements. One of uh, the most unpleasant ones for Belarusian and Ukrainian citizens, it is uh, an agreement to avoid double taxation. And uh, Belarus also facilitates this. Belarus uh, suspended the agreement with Poland on recognition of uh, uh, certificates in uh, uh, education, art and music, and even regional authorities uh, that uh, used to have some brotherhood relations between uh, town cities uh, organizations and academies of sciences start terminating their agreements uh, concluded dozens of years ago so we can conclude that belarus becomes a toxic zone perceived by the international partners and first of all as a source of various threats uh, not as the party to cooperate with but as a source of uh, various threats. At this backdrop, Belarus expands cooperation with the non-recognized uh, and occupied territories. Uh, I don't want to say this, but uh, it looks like similar things attach similar things. Uh, by isolating itself from Western countries, from the partners that uh, relations used to be relatively good, today they have to look for options uh, in cooperating with uh, non-recognize their territories so they not only expand uh, this but they elevate it to a higher level for the first time after the georgian war of uh, of the war between russia and georgia in 2008 lukashenko visited uh, abkhazia occupied territory and he met the leader uh, of this uh, uh, non-elected leader of, uh, and uh, kukharev mayor of minsk uh, signed an agreement on behalf of Minsk city to cooperate with the occupied city of Sevastopol in Crimea with the administration, which is the occupational administration. At that, at the backdrop of this negative uh, line that's going on uh, on the side of the Belarusian government, we can also see the positive things. Before I move to the positive things, I would like to mention one more thing, which I forgot to mention. There's a deeper disruption between Belarus and uh, Europe, and uh, there's a vivid example. Even when the charge d'affair of the EU, the Belarus, uh, Madame Schulz, was uh, detained for some time, they wanted her, her, to force her to sign a 
protocol of detention and uh, she had uh, the diplomatic community they were not entitled uh, to detain her it was not a scandal it was below radars so the attention was not focused on that the situation is so bad uh, that even in, uh, such scandalous things uh, are not uh, discussed now moving to positive things estonia helped uh, uh, the cabinet of uh, Tikhanovskaya's office uh, to be at the UN General Assembly and uh, the response of Belarusian authorities was quick. Uh, they reduced uh, the staff uh, in their embassy in Tallinn and they uh, forced uh, the Estonian authorities to, to uh, adopt the reciprocal measures. So today the embassy in Belarus is uh, the smallest one and uh, this played a positive role for the Belarusian democratic forces. This enabled them to gradually institu institutionalize uh, their diplomatic relations and ties. Pavel, please uh, wrap up. Okay, give me a minute, if you, if you let me. Estonia sent its diplomat to cooperate with uh, the democratic forces. Uh, this person is not going to be in Minsk, but in Vilnius. Uh, in Belgium, there's a mission of the democratic forces. It's a symbolic embassy of the Belarusian democratic movement. Lithuania offered Tikhanovska to control the lists uh, of people coming to the spa uh, in Lithuania, which belongs uh, to the Belarusian government. At the Nobel Prize uh, award ceremony, uh, when Alice Bilaski was uh, awarded uh, not uh, the ambassador of Belarus to, uh, to Sweden, but uh, Tikhanovsky was invited there. The Council of Europe is not going to cooperate with the Belarusian authorities. That was their decision. So the contacts of uh, Belarus in the Council of Europe will be channeled only through the civil society. So I'm wrapping up. Uh, we also have a, a block of information on Ukraine. There's a, a description on the democratic forces. Probably uh, I will leave it to you to study yourself, but uh, I, I hope, uh, I encourage you to read this report. It is really interesting to read. Thank you very much, Pavel. I'm going to post the link to the report in our Zoom chat, and I'm passing the floor to our next presenter, Artem Schreiber. Domestic policy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lera. Many trends uh, that we uh, discussed uh, in the previous uh, editions, they continue to, and I believe that this is the key trend, that this is uh, drifting to anti-democratic leaders. The Belarusian authorities recognize uh, in their wording, in their laws, uh, that they want to abandon even decorative elements of uh, the, the power of people. For example, the law on all Belarusian People's Assembly and the amendments to the Electoral Code. According to all these published documents, we can see that the role of direct elections as an institution, certainly with all the disruptions that uh, we used to have in Belarus, it's uh, getting smaller because uh, the all Belarusian People's Assembly is going to be the top authority in the hierarchy of Belarusian government, it will not be elected directly by the people. and. Uh, some pro-government uh, analysts uh, tried uh, to delicately uh, criticize it, uh, that uh, there would be no direct election, that people would be appointed by the bureaucracy. Lukashenko said, this is the idea. We don't want to have people, uh, people's representation. Uh, people's representation is ensured by the parliament, and here we need professionals at the, the All Belarusian People's Assembly. One of the authorities of the Assembly is directly related with the opportunity to, uh, to reject the decisions of the voters, like impeachment of the president, uh, abandonment of uh, laws and decrees adopted by other branches of power. As for me, the most outstanding thing is that this Assembly uh, will be entitled uh, to say that uh, the presidential elections are not legitimate. So let's say somebody can be, become a winner, president-elect, and then the assembly will simply cancel the elections. 
and this can be repeated uh, for as long as you want. Uh, so that's a novelty. Certainly in the electoral code, uh, there are minor changes, but uh, uh, it looks like uh, any possible stress of the electoral committees would not be allowed. People won't be able uh, to uh, make pictures of their ballots, uh, won't be able to be there as observers at elections. So now we don't have it. And uh, also, Belarusians that are abroad won't be able to vote at embassies of Belarus because otherwise the the government would have to either falsify elections or the outcomes of the elections or would not be nice to the government. And then this is not even a trend, uh, but the attribute of the Belarusian state machine. This is active engagement of uh, pro-government propagandists uh, and activists into reprisals, repression, and other types of pressure on the opponents. And they close the cultural events, exhibitions, uh, they pressure diplomats. This happens uh, more often through engaging these ideological inspectors, people who use their blogs, TV programs uh, to pin, pinpoint, to uh, finger point the people uh, to be to be chased. Uh, it's it's not a funny thing in Belarus, uh, but uh, they cancel Halloween's uh, saying that uh, this is uh, for witches, then uh, this is ridiculous. And there are multiple examples provided for in our report. So I will skip the details. But it is important to understand that this practice gets us closer to the totalitarian past, because in the Soviet uh, times, uh, many reprisals uh, had uh, some uh, some uh, some finger pointing in the uh, government press, and then reprisals would start. And then we can see uh, other trends that started before autumn. We can see politicization of military units. Of uh, uh, we can see this happening in the Kalinovsky uh, regiment. Uh, they have. Uh, uh, the council of 10 people and they started uh, engaging in the political activities in Ukraine and uh, uh, and in the democratic forces of Belarus uh, uh, there are various uh, m militarized processes militarization processes uh, so they start uh, organizing uh, sports and military classes and these uh, two uh, cross-cutting trends uh, inspired militarization of the Belarusian regime as well. And uh, this is not only about military exercise that we can permanently see when uh, they check uh, the data of all conscripts. Uh, I even received two, two, uh, two uh, sapoenas to, to, to go there. And also this is about expanding uh, the mechanism of reprisals. So uh, at uh, the uh, uh, police units, they decided to expand these activities. They expanded the network of regional police uh, lyceums. Uh, the government expands financing for law enforcers because the Belarusian budget uh, is unprecedented uh, for the next year in terms of increasing expenditures for both uh, the military and uh, law enforcers. It's not only about higher salaries, but higher numbers. And the last uh, element that we can see, consolidation uh, in the democratic forces uh, has stopped. Uh, it was in summer. And today we can see fragmentation. It's back. It's not fatal, but we can already see that there's competition in some issues between the cabinet and uh, uh, the Kalinovsky's uh, regiment, uh, which is getting more politicized. Uh, we can see scandals. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, the Minister of uh, Finance, Zaritska, leaving uh, the office and the scandal with the Russian uh, passport of uh, the Shadow Minister of Defense, Valery uh, Sakashik, and uh, Baipol uh, officer leaving the, uh, the Baipol, and also the scandal, scandal about the infiltration of KHP officer in the Black Book of Belarus, and then the democratic forces had to explain it. There's no any structural damage uh, to the democratic forces, but uh, this is a scandalous uh, fog, and we can see this fragmentation continued even after uh, the period of reporting finished, uh, even in December. 
cyber partisans uh, uh, resistance the resistance movement as they call themselves they supported the cabinet in august and today uh, they joined the kiev oppositional center that is concentrated around the kalinovsky's regiment thank you thank you artem and right now we move to the economic uh, dimension of our discussion uh, katerina barnikova uh, will uh, review the foreign economic aspect. Uh, thank you. Good evening, all. About the trends uh, that uh, we have uh, been seeing in uh, the foreign economic relations continuum, they are persistent. Uh, there is a persistent trend uh, to shrink economic relations with our Western neighbors. Despite no new sanctions were introduced uh, in autumn by the EU, exports uh, to EU continues uh, shrinking. If we look at exports from Belarus uh, to EU in September, it sh shrank uh, by 60%. Despite the fact that some of the commodities uh, expand uh, those that are not under sanctions. An interesting thing is that expanded uh, electricity supplies go to Lithuania. It's the leading consumer of Belarusian electricity and we can expect these exports uh, to grow because Belarus at last commissioned uh, the first uh, uh, NPP uh, a unit after repairs. There's another uh, thing mentioned in the media that Belarus uh, has been trying to use other countries of the Eurasian Economic Union to avoid sanctions. We can see it in uh, woodworking. If we compare imports uh, to the EU from such countries as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and other Central Asian countries that are members of this union or they are associated with it, then we can see that some commodity items uh, that are under sanctions uh, uh, in Belarus, uh, we can see that these commodities to grow. There's a 15 million uh, growth uh, of woodworking uh, supplied from Kazakhstan to Europe. Certainly it's a small portion of those 400 million euros of exports of woodworking that Belarus uh, lost due to sanctions. But I'm afraid that if this process is not uh, uh, terminated, then these 15 million uh, millions are going to be just the beginning. Now, speaking about uh, feeding away relations with the EU, there's a growing economic uh, relation with Russia. The growth of exports to Russia is uh, four. It, it is four billion already, and therefore this year of uh, the Russian market in the uh, Belarusian exports is uh, certainly crossed the 60% bar and it's close to 70%. I would like to stress there's no reason to believe uh, that input substitution is operational. We do not know successful cases and there are no reasons to believe that uh, this is about uh, about uh, 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 rechanneling uh, under sanctions goods uh, to Russia. Well, at least uh, petroleum products are not there this is about uh, um, making prices higher and expanding uh, the uh, the the uh, expanding the volume of supply of the same things that Belarus supplied to Russia. An important thing that happened in relations with Russia is the conclusion and approval of the cooperation plan, and not only the plan but a cooperation agreement envisaged in one of the union programs. Uh, it is on indirect taxes, and indirect tax agreement is one of the key ones. This is probably the only one, which means that there will be a supranational body established. Uh, this will give access to Russia to see the transactions uh, of Belarusian uh, companies. And uh, this opens uh, uh, the Russian market to Belarusian petroleum products. And uh, I would say that deepening cooperation with Russia is to the benefit of the Belarusian economy here and uh, now, and Belarus cannot reject it, but everybody understands that this is an increase in dependence, and this can be dangerous, and uh, it is dangerous today and will be in the future. Therefore, Belarus is desperate uh, to, uh, to find uh, foreign economic partners. Belarus looks at China, and in autumn, Belarusian authorities 
happily reported that uh, there was a, a, an agreement concluded with China on whether all round uh, cooperation exports to China grow. This makes us think that exports of potash fertilizers continue in the same scope. Maybe it's a bit smaller than before, and uh, the, the potash that Belarus is capable to export, this potash is forwarded to, to China, first of all, but Chinese investments uh, dropped in 2020, and we cannot see uh, Chinese investment growing. Therefore, the prospects of developing relations with China uh, are still uh, uh, misty, and uh, and uh, this is uh, 15 times uh, sm uh, smaller than the exports uh, supplied to Russia. Uh, this is it with the foreign economic trends, and I'm passing the floor to Lev Livovsky, my colleague, who will tell us about the trends in the domestic economy of Belarus. Thank you. In the domestic economy, the main trend is the fact that Belarus continues being in recession. October figure of uh, drop uh, year on year is 4.7%. Uh, uh, this is a decrease in GDP. Real wages in October dropped uh, by 4.5% year on year. We do not have figures for November. These figures. Uh, better reflect uh, the status of the economy rather than in September or in August, because in August and September uh, the data uh, was disrupted uh, by a late but successful harvest, which uh, made uh, uh, the August uh, drop of the GDP uh, by more than 10%, and the September drop was uh, too small. Speaking of quality trends, uh, in uh, the industrial production, we can mention the uh, uh, we can mention the problems in the IT sector. Previously, ICT would always be the driver of the Belarusian economy, but after the war uh, broke, uh, a few months after the war started, the IT sector became one of the sectors uh, that one of the one of the largest. Uh, uh, negative champions, uh, IT sector is uh, minus 8% uh, year on year, and the most uh, worrisome uh, thing about the ICT cluster is a significant relocation, a dropout of staff uh, in uh, mid and large sized enterprises, uh, uh, employing 16 people and more. In uh, 2020, there were more than 22,000 uh, people. After the war started, Belarus lost 14,000 of those. Uh, so here we can see uh, a drop of 25 to 30 percent. Woodworking could not uh, cope uh, with the sanctions. Still, uh, this sector that shows one of the largest drops, if we look at real wages employed there, Ekaterina mentioned uh, that there were some uh, attempts uh, to supply through third countries, but these attempts are not resulting in uh, woodworking uh, employees. And uh, in oil refinery business, uh, they managed to uh, get out of ditch that was in spring. And uh, today we can indirectly see that uh, oil refineries uh, um, uh, uh, have 80% performance of their pre-war pre performance and uh, their sales are almost uh, on the same level as a year ago. And the main uh, trend uh, in our economy, our domestic trend, but for the recession, is uh, the persistent trend uh, of uh, more active engagement, involvement, uh, interference of the government into the economy. They try to exercise manual controls. Uh, in the current uh, period, we've managed to see a few things uh, that we could read uh, only in the books on uh, military communism. The only difference uh, is that uh, there is no uh, chicken in uh, war times, and uh, Lukashenko was uh, instructing how to uh, how to cut uh, chicken into pieces. Uh, on October 6, uh, Lukashenko banned uh, price increases 
This resulted uh, in detentions of uh, over 20 entrepreneurs, uh, over 30 criminal cases were opened. Uh, ultimately, uh, this populism uh, measure managed to hit the target. According to the opinion polls organized by Birok, uh, the measure was popular uh, among 63% of urban population of Belarus, but still, Luckily, it was uh, replaced uh, by a soft uh, regime of price monitoring. So today, prices are monitored. Uh, 270 SKUs uh, are controlled by the government, and uh, this uh, practically entirely covers uh, the statistical uh, food basket of an ordinary Belarusian. It is possible to raise prices if you appeal to special committees and if you use a special system of maximum factors. And this new system is quite sophisticated uh, in use, but easy in theory, on paper. And uh, this brought the economy into a relative misunderstanding. Therefore, some entrepreneurs even had uh, to uh, to suspend uh, their operations in the market. And then some mass media believed that it was uh, uh, a strike, but they simply didn't know how to operate in a new environment. There's an exemplary thing when the Minister of Anti-Monopoly and Trade tried to explain to entrepreneurs how to introduce those uh, factors or coefficients. One of the entrepreneurs wondered when a cucumber or a tomato, when you cut it, becomes a salad because cucumbers and tomatoes are, have their prices controlled. and. Uh, when when you cut it into pieces, uh, then the price uh, should be the same as for the whole tomato and uh, cucumber. But when you mix it, uh, it becomes a salad, and then the salad is not a price-controlled SKU. Another channel for the government to interfere into the economy that we could see during this period uh, was a vivid uh, 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 plan to uh, pump uh, investments uh, into the economy. Prime Minister Golovchenko mentioned a few times that in 2023 investments uh, would grow by 22 percent, but considering the current uh, climate in Belarus, uh, he meant public investment. And this uh, was uh, seen in the draft uh, budget for 2023, which says uh, there would be a growth in the ceiling of the public debt and a new budget deficit. And the last novelty that fits into this trend, however, we do not mention it in our report, is a recent uh, uh, a meeting of Lukashenko on the high-tech park uh, issues. Uh, civil servants uh, discussed uh, how to teach uh, IT uh, engineers uh, what uh, products to develop and uh, what should be their operating modality. We believe that uh, this manual control of the economy will continue despite uh, some challenges in enforcing such measures. This is it, and I'm passing the floor to Valeria Lev. Thank you. Right now, we are coming to the final, but uh, equally interesting sociology block. I'm passing the floor to Filip Bikanov, who is going to share the dynamics of the public opinion this autumn. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lera. Hello, everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Give me a second, because I uh, have my slides for you, as usual. I believe you can see it. Good. Perfect. Hello, colleagues. Right now, we are going to discuss uh, the trends that we can see, or we believe we see, in the Belarusian society, in the Belarusian public opinion. Uh, prior to going to the outcomes, let's make a few disclaimers. We collected this information <laughs> through an online survey. It was an online panel. We had 999 respondents. Uh, it was done in late November, November 23rd through the 28th. It's not a, 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 a 
uh, it's not an equal opportunity for Belarusian citizens to get into this sample. And this might explain differences between the reality, which nobody uh, is aware of and cannot measure, and uh, uh, what we can see in the results. So this can be because of the structure of sample. We are trying to mitigate this uh, through re-weighing, uh, through verifications, etc. And also, coming forward, uh, I will spoil this sixth uh, uh, section to be presented by Knight uh, Korshinov. Uh, reprisals uh, are persistent in Belarus, and this uh, affects uh, the uh, fear factor. And despite the fact that we also try to 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 keep this in mind and uh, to, to 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 take uh, to, to utilize other measures that are not affected by fear still we believe that this might affect our figures our values that we get uh, through the survey for example we have a high dropout rate which is uh, higher than the uh, online survey uh, dropout rate uh, usually it's a uh, a standard value but it is quite high some people do not come to us we say this openly and we know this therefore the distributions you are going to see might be different from reality usually uh, well this is the end of my disclaimer and i'm moving forward because we can see dynamics even if some figures uh, may mismatch uh, with uh, some uh, values that exist uh, in the society if we poll every Belarusian then we can see the dynamics clearly uh, the dynamics of uh, the trust uh, to the regime causes doubts uh, it is a significant value unfortunately we were not able to uh, use an additional online panel to verify this we we did it uh, during the previous two polls but this time we didn't manage to do it it's the end of the year and uh, it has been difficult to do now knowing all this i would ask my colleagues who are from the mass media uh, to be uh, to be careful when you make publications and now i'm proceeding with my presentation so let's start with the whole thing we measure trust uh, to the regime using multi-dimensional cluster analysis based on the answers to questions uh, like the trust of various representatives of the regime or those who are against the regime like independent media or the people who voted against Lukashenko in 2020 or the people who are political prisoners as they are called so what can we see the number of people who are grouped uh, as uh, supporters, uh, they're light gray. This number has increased uh, since August. Uh, what does that mean? First of all, this can be explained uh, that people are afraid. The fear factor is one of the explanations. It's impossible to verify this, but we're working on this because we are surprised to see the change. When we could see this change last time, it was from October till May. And initially, in our tracker, we did not plan to use the second panel. But after we saw the dynamics from October to May, we were obliged to verify uh, to exclude external factors, but for uh, the societal dynamics. And the second panel provided us uh, different uh, figures at uh, different chairs, but the dynamics was still the same. Today, in this case, uh, we cannot cut off the fear factor, but we think about tools and methods to avoid this in the future. In addition, uh, this is an online uh, survey, an online panel, and as I said, uh, different people have different uh, likelihoods to get into it, so these fluctuations can also explain these dynamics, and this is significant, 7%. If we imagine that uh, this dynamics uh, has uh, real reasons, what could be the reasons? What can we see? First of all, this is the growth of social optimism. Everything here is uh, is, uh, prob uh, is probably about growing social optimism, and I believe in it. Our colleagues uh, published the economic tracker, the colleagues from Barak, 
and they identify the, the Consumer Confidence Index. And uh, this index uh, has improved uh, throughout the report period, which, uh, which complies with our period. We can see that uh, the, uh, the Family Index, the Countries Index and the Expectations Index uh, got higher. This increase, this growth is largely explained uh, um, by uh, the growth uh, in the group called uh, ardent supporters of the government and uh, we believe that we should also consider these people in the social optimism studies in the identity study which we presented uh, recently there is information saying that the economic element is also important for the people who fight the regime who believe well they do not believe who we refer to ardent uh, opponents of the regime Therefore, uh, these uh, perceived economic normalization or slowdown in the in the in the draw up in the fall that we can feel, and also the populism measure of uh, price freezing, uh, certainly caused some uh, social optimism. This is one of the things: a growing trust. A part of the growing trust that can be explained by economics by the economic trust. And the second thing is, is the consensus about non-engagement into the war. Despite the fact that in our society there are many uh, uh, disruption lines uh, like uh, on values, on political views, we can see that the majority, vast majority, uh, uh, which is cross-cutting for all segments of the society who are convinced that, that the Belarusian army should not be engaged in the war. Uh, uh, it should be as far as possible from the war in Ukraine. It should not be neither on the Russian nor on the Ukrainian side. So, uh, certainly the rhetoric becomes more and more pro-Russian, but the regime of Lukashenko and Lukashenko himself uh, try to say that they don't want to be in the war. They don't want uh, to for the Belarusian army to be an accomplice in the war. They un only, uh, only once in a few months they might say that the Belarusian infrastructure is used to, to, to organize bombardments of Ukraine. So they avoided the topic of the war, acknowledging uh, that uh, this is the topic that is not comfortable uh, for the majority of Belarusians and the and the growth of trust uh, at the backdrop of mobilization in Russia, which was a shock uh, for people there. And uh, certainly some of uh, these uh, sentiment leaked into Belarus and uh, and there's a stronger uh, trust because Belarus is not engaged in the war. And the third factor, this is economic populism. We are getting to it uh, soon, but I would like to mention the agenda how uh, what is the effect of the agenda as we can see the agenda of the democratic forces uh, is not uh, getting to the majority of uh, to, to many people in, in belarus many people in belarus live uh, according to the government or pro-russian agenda this can be seen in the belarusian uh, change tracker we asked uh, questions about the events do you think that the event happened or not in october or in late October, in early November, or in, in October, or in early November, I don't remember exactly, we can look at the report. So the percentage can be different from the real level of uh, acknowledgement uh, about uh, Tatiana Zarezka leaving the United uh, Transitional Cabinet, but Tatiana Zarezka left uh, the cabinet and Lukashenko visited uh, the championship on, on cutting firewood. We can see what dominates, what agenda dominates, and we can see that even scandalous uh, oppositional agenda is known only to the people who are ardent opponents of the regime. The importance uh, uh, um, of Zarezka leaving the cabinet is similar to uh, uh, to uh, having a penguin born in Minsk Zoo. So uh, this agenda is largely controlled by the state, and it is pro-Russian. 
it is pro, it is uh, pro regime so information isolation can also uh, can also increase uh, trust uh, to lukashenko's regime and we can see that the price is frozen for all foods this was known to the majority of belarusians and uh, the majority of belarusians also believe that this is important and only uh, those who are ardent opponents, uh, uh, they, they show smaller numbers, but still they believe it is. it was an important event. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a question by Berak, 63% uh, of people supported the measure. Yes, we can believe that this uh, economic populism is operational in the uh, short term, in a short run. And despite the fluctuations inside the panel, despite the f uh, effect of the fear factor that we cannot uh, neglect and we 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 still uh, we can still believe that uh, the trust is growing to the regime and then as christopher said my projections uh, or my forecasts in one of the editions uh, of the track uh, were were, were uh, overestimated thank you Thank you very much, Philip. And now I'm passing the floor to Yanais Korshino. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I welcome you, colleagues and all people present here. So let's start. I'm going to uh, answer the question by Philip. Reprisals uh, have not become smaller, but uh, they have expanded. This is the main trend between uh, in relations between the government and the society. Inside, instead of uh, the amnesty uh, that was expected, that was discussed, uh, uh, we can see a new wave of uh, reprisals. Uh, the number of politically motivated detentions has increased by 3.5 times since summer. The number of uh, court hearings uh, has increased by 1.5 times. Uh, cruelty. Uh, cruelty of uh, punishment uh, has increased uh, uh, the number of years uh, to which uh, the accused the sentence has increased by three times so we can see long detention periods long imprisonments uh, that uh, that uh, the prisoners were were uh, sentenced to uh, an average uh, uh, monthly increase uh, of uh, prisoners was 87. Uh, it used to be 87, and then it got 109, and uh, now uh, it is over 130. And uh, today, the number of women uh, that are detained is higher than in summer, 26 uh, versus 24 in summer, on average. And we can see that there is a mini trend about the environment uh, in uh, detention. We can see that the relatives of political prisoners are uh, chased and prosecuted. Uh, if uh, people cannot be detained, then uh, their relatives are chased. Uh, now there is a trend uh, of uh, whole families uh, being detained, like brothers, cousins. There were a few cases like that. Uh, like a father and the son, but usually uh, they detain a husband and a wife together. There's another trend uh, and it fluctuates. Uh, sometimes it is higher, sometimes it is smaller during, during the reporting period. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the trend of, uh, to detain employees of one factory or company, uh, there was a wave of detentions uh, in one of uh, uh, the factories, and uh, three people were arrested. Uh, so, uh, and there are uh, also repressions of some professional groups, priests uh, and uh, truck drivers, and you never know who is going to be the next group. Uh, there are uh, new repressions against uh, the media and uh, defense lawyers. Defense lawyers were kick kicked out of the Bar Association and they don't, uh, uh, their, their licenses are revoked, and right now they are under criminal pun, uh, criminal investigations. And uh, also, this is about journalists, whether people write about politics or not. You can look uh, 
uh, at the details in the report. Also, uh, and we, we can also see uh, in, in new types of uh, criminal cases against uh, those uh, who gave interviews uh, to the so-called extremist uh, media. Igor Libidok, a military expert, is going to be sentenced uh, in a few days uh, because uh, he gave an interview to an extremism uh, TV channel. There's another large trend. Uh, my uh, my colleagues mentioned uh, uh, mentioned uh, manual uh, controls uh, in the government. Uh, the same happens here. Uh, the military factor that uh, the society. Uh, uh, was paying attention to. Uh, after that, the government decided uh, to to uh, to to uh, decided to take preventive measures uh, against the things. Uh, uh, so, the government uh, prevents any type of resistance. We can clearly see this uh, about uh, civil servants and uh, the last. Uh, uh, draft law which is not covered uh, which is not in our report period but uh, it fits into the autumn trend uh, this is many controls and squeezing all uh, all elements of the uh, government vertical so they are actually ordered to do the same to their subordinates in their units organizations departments there's another trend, and uh, this has been expected. This was autumn, September 1st. High attention to education. And there was also an accident in one of private schools. So ultimately, what do we have? We have, we have uh, the entire termination of the private uh, education in Belarus. Today, we also have uh, uh, increased uh, ideology uh, processing and today this uh, has been aggravated intensified in all dimensions and at all levels this is not only about uh, schools but also about kindergartens preschools so the context is uh, that we do not need education but we need ideological upbringing and this should be started in the kindergarten. There's also militarization of uh, the education because uh, uh, police is more engaged in the educational process. Uh, and uh, the details and cases are provided in the full text of the report. You can find uh, all these sections uh, which deserve your reading. And the last trend, the war of cultures continues because on the one hand the regime intensifies censorship and pressures by controlling and exterminating all uh, and everything associated with anything Belarusian symbols first of all I believe that everybody could see that even the slogan long live belarus known for over 100 years was called a fascist uh, slogan if you raise your hand when you say this but i don't think that neither kgb nor police uh, uh, swat uh, would pay attention to 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 the hand uh, whether it is up or down so the only thing uh, uh, which is left is to promote uh, Belarusian language and culture. There's more and more Belarusian language content. The content uh, is uh, being consumed by the people and the media either start uh, fully moving into Belarusian language, either fully, as a few of them do, or they, or they translate part of their content into Belarusian language. They do this concurrently. They provide their content concurrently in Russian, in Belarusian. The uh, the cultural activities uh, have been expanding, but not in Belarus, uh, but abroad. Belarusians uh, make this more active abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady.
к сессии вопросов и ответов. Now we proceed with the Q&A. I urge uh, uh, all the participants uh, to ask questions in the Zoom, and I'm going to read them one by one. Some of the questions were received prior to the discussion. The first question is addressed to all presenters. Do you acknowledge that you are responsible for, uh, for these statements, or you are responsible only for your own statements in this general project? Please be brief. Maybe you would like to comment this, or shall we use the same, the same sequence? Let it be Pavel first. I believe you can see and hear me. Well, when I hear such questions, uh, it looks like I should give an oath. Well, this is uh, not, uh, this tracker is not an individual research or analysis. It's not a compilation of several studies in one report, but certainly this is the opinion of the team of uh, experts, uh, who, researchers. Certainly we are responsible for our parts, but we discuss it and uh, we discuss it together. And uh, then we find a compromise to, to address uh, some uh, disagreements. Uh, so I don't think there's a reason to, to uh, ask this question to other presenters. Thank you, Pavel. I fully agree with you. So let's proceed with the other question. Uh, what is the largest uh, factor that uh, impedes uh, changes in Belarus? So maybe you will continue. Uh, the factor impeding uh, changes in Belarus. I can call uh, the name of one person and you know this person, that's the, the largest factor. But jokes aside, I believe that information isolation is one of the key factors, reprisals or repressions uh, are the second factor. Uh, this is the totalitarian system. Uh, that uh, has been in Belarus uh, for a for hundred years, not only f uh, for, for recent years. Uh, this uh, what uh, makes the class or the public sentiment uh, that uh, distracts us uh, from some positive scenarios. Uh, in, since 2020, we can see that the reprisals have been aggravating, so uh, the reprisals uh, push people not to be in politics. If we look at what uh, happened to Belarus uh, from 2014 until 2020, when Belarus was getting closer to the Western countries, Belarus was uh, uh, was willing to, to to diminish reprisals. People were not uh, taken to prisons so much. Uh, there were practically no political prisoners. There were no internationally recognized political prisoners they appeared in 2020. So people during this period of time felt more freedom. And in 2020, there were people who were not, uh, who had not been interested in politics. So the society was getting more politicized uh, and many people uh, mistakenly thought that Belarus was not uh, an authoritarian state. Uh, in 2020, people were shown that they were wrong. And, and we can see that uh, Belarus turns uh, from authoritarian to totalitarian or half totalitarian state. And I believe that this is the key factor. And if we leave the thesis that the idea that everything is about uh, one person who designed the system in uh, uh, 1994 through to 1996, then the second factor uh, is people and their fear. Thank you, Pavel. Philip, you, the floor is yours. I would like to elaborate. We have to understand what changes are. Changes can be uh, quite abrupt. Uh, they can be technical changes, etc. And here, apart from reprisals, it's clear that the, the police uh, club uh, is uh, what slows down uh, changes in Belarus, uh, I echo Pavel, but the, it is also important what Belarusians think about the this the, this, the government system, uh, uh, the, 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 the number of benefits, practices that uh, could be useful to people. People might feel themselves uh, as beneficiaries of the system or not. Quite a lot of people believe that Belarus is not the worst country. It's a social state. It helps people. People are employed. 
and uh, some super uh, abrupt steep, uh, steep uh, changes will not be perceived well by these people. And this is a uh, an impending factor. In 2020, uh, compromise could be found if uh, Lukashenko did not steal election, because otherwise the person uh, who is in prison today, uh, Viktor Babarika, would probably win in the presidential election. And Viktor Babarika could be a compromise figure to ensure refreshment of the system and uh, would not break the system. So this is it. So if we speculate, uh, the society needs change uh, or wants changes, uh, but to a different degree, uh, this is secondary. The regime in the country represses people and even stops uh, even stops any demand for change. Thank you, Artem. Since Pavel got into my political domain, I dare to get into his domain. I believe that the main impediment uh, to changes is uh, that in comparative uh, 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 politology, they call it uh, the effect of uh, a black uh, 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 night, uh, and uh, there's uh, uh, the magnet, uh, there's Russia, which is big and stronger. Therefore, uh, Lukashenko has been ruling Belarus for th almost 30 years and uh, there's the class of stakeholders who are satisfied with the format of relations uh, that exist, exist uh, for several decades. Uh, uh, this is the parasite uh, modality. This is win-win for the Belarusian regime and its Russian donors. As long as this continues, any domestic uh, the democracy impulses that emerged in 2020 uh, that that, that uh, exceeded the Belarusian regime. All these uh, impulses are blocked because there's a clear disbalance uh, of possibilities and opportunities between the stakeholders who have relations with Russia and the rest of the society. So I personally believe this is uh, this is not the domestic uh, factors that are the key impediments to changes. Lev, you wanted to add something? Yes. Basically speaking, I mostly agree with my colleagues. Right now we can name a few things that impact Belarusian economy to develop sanctions, lost Western markets, lost Ukrainian market, uh, uh, excessive uh, deepening into the Russian market. The Russian economy is much uh, bigger than the Belarusian economy, but for the last decade, uh, the Russian economy was growing 1% a year. Next decade, uh, it is very likely because of the sanctions, the growth in Russia will be even smaller. So 70% of our trade, uh, which is very important because of our uh, economy type, uh, uh, this will be the uh, stagnating economy. There can be various and uh, multiple factors, but indeed all these factors are not because of the personality of Alexander Lukashenko, but because of his uh, desire that uh, is not appropriate in modern economies to stay in power by all possible means. And uh, this desire uh, has actually uh, triggered sanctions uh, against Belarus and uh, Belarus could be used uh, as a land uh, to attack Ukraine. So this caused um, uh, anti-war sanctions and then this uh, disrupted uh, the access of Belarus to modern technologies. Thank you, Lev. Kenazi, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to say that it depends on the level of our analysis. These factors will be different at different levels. Definitely, at all levels, the, the main impediment will be the personality of Alexander Lukashenko and the regime that he has designed. 
but I would like to be speaking about uh, philosophy. The revolution that started in 2020 is not over, and changes have been going on. There is always, there have, has always been a demand for change, but uh, whether there are any opportunities uh, to implement uh, changes. And when I say that the revolution is not over, Text uh, books uh, say that uh, there's con contra revolution uh, going on, but uh, the more the, the harsher this uh, this stage, when uh, the government uh, uh, suspends uh, changes, the more uh, the more energy, the more passionate energy is generated inside. Thank you, Gennady. We have one more question. The question is from the chat. Can public uh, uh, opinion be affected uh, by the migration of uh, the protest segment of the society? Well, I will start. Colleagues, please elaborate after me, if you will. Yes, this is possible, but uh, this factor is challenged. Uh, there's practically there's practically no exact way to measure how many people relocated and uh, what political uh, force uh, they uh, they believe uh, they belong to. What we can see in the polls, personal expectations uh, or the desire to immigrate is uh, uh, am among those uh, who are uh, protesters or who are against the regime. So we can believe that they are the, the, the largest majority of uh, those who migrated on uh, December 1st. Uh, Andrei Kazakevich at the Minsk Forum said that in Lithuania, according to his uh, study, people are not uh, uh, are not the people who who relocated because of politics. They they relocated uh, for making more money. So we can see uh, that the protesters uh, have been leaving the country. Whether this has a significant impact or not, I don't know. And I'm afraid that nobody can answer this question. Thank you very much, Philip. I can see we don't have any more questions, so I suggest uh, to, to close this presentation. Thank you all for joining us on Friday night to have a discussion. I would like to remind you that uh, the third edition of the Belarus uh, Change Tracker is on the website of the Friedrich Albert Stiftung. So thank you all and see you soon. Thank you all and goodbye.